Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's program on understanding how to use polling data in your reporting. My name is Bara Vaida. I am the Director of Training for the National Press Club Journalism Institute. Before we get started, I just I want to start off with a few housekeeping items. We have a closed captioning option available during this program, and we're putting instructions in the chat now. We'll be recording this program and a link to the video will be emailed to you. So if you miss something, don't worry, you'll have a chance to catch it a second time. Highlights from the program will also appear on our website and in our newsletter with the video. And if you aren't already receiving the Institute's daily newsletter for journalists, you can subscribe now. So to get started, horse race coverage is a staple of political reporting, for better or for worse. So if you are going to be using polls, it's important to assess which polls are worth paying attention to and which aren't. And it seems like it's harder and harder today with how many polls are flooding reporters' email boxes. So I'm really looking forward to hearing the thoughts of our fantastic panelists today. And of course, we hope that those of you who are tuning in today will join us by offering comments and questions so that we have a little bit of community as well um, for the next hour. So please go ahead and drop into the chat where you're tuning in from. And also please share your questions and comments on the chat function, not the Q&A. So each of our speakers will talk about polls and we'll leave about 20 to 25 minutes for your questions. And now it's my honor to introduce our speakers today. In the interest of time, I won't read out their full bios, but I'll introduce them in the order that they'll be speaking. So we're gonna start with Courtney Kennedy. She is Vice President of Methods and Innovation at the Pew Research Center. She's gonna give us a kind of a brief lesson on poll literacy and talk about how Pew structures their nonpartisan polls. And next speaking will be uh, Professor Jane Jun. She's a professor of political science at the University of Southern California. And she's going to talk about where and how to find polling data on non-white and women voters, how polling data might impact voting habits, her thoughts on how not to get spun by campaigns when it comes to polling data. And next will be Lewis Jacobson. He is senior correspondent with PolitiFact. He is just back from covering New Hampshire primaries. Then we'll talk about how he uses polls in his reporting and red flags to look out for when you're analyzing polls. And our next speaker will be Erin Covey. She is the U.S. House Analyst for the Cook Political Report, and she will talk about how she uses local polls and also the red flags to watch out for in your reporting. So now I'm going to turn it over to Courtney, and thanks so much for being here today. All right. Good morning. Uh, it's great to be with everybody. I'm going to share my screen momentarily here. Okay. Good. Sorry, I'm just trying to get it in presenter mode, but there's a bar. There we go. Okay, here we are. All right. Um, so back up. All right, I'm going to give you some um, key uh, things to keep in mind as you're covering polling this uh, this election. Um, happy to, to get into more detail uh, in the, the Q&A at the end. So one foundational thing to know is that polling today is incredibly diverse in terms of the methods that are used. Um, on the left side of this chart, it's sort of like, you know, 20, 25 years ago, pretty much everybody was polling by telephone. Then you fast forward to today, and what you see is just this incredible diversity of um, uh, a lot of uh, online polls being done, some phones still, you know, we've got robo polling, text polling, and frankly, a lot of kind of mix and match going on in polling. Um, and, and they have different strengths and weaknesses. The main thing I would point I would make here is that any good poller, pollster will tell you exactly how their poll was done. So they should be very transparent about the methods that they used. Another foundational question is sort of like, you know, what are pollsters doing? What is the good of a poll, especially this far out? So I think one myth that's out there that's that's really incorrect uh, is the notion that polls done this far out are trying to accurately forecast 
you know, the, the outcome of the race in November. That's not true. If you talk to a good pollster, uh, good pollsters are trying to provide useful, accurate information about how the campaign is unfolding and really about the mood of the electorate. And I think an excellent example of this was the New York Times battleground poll that came out in November. They weren't trying to get you know, the horse race correct a year out. No, what they were trying to do was really assess what is the mood of voters in these really important places. And um, they showed how support for Biden is a lot softer than I think a lot of people had been assuming. Um, no longer assuming that today, I think in part because this poll shed light on that. And they went into great depth about the reasons for that. Um, what are the concerns voters have about Biden and Trump? Um, and, and where exactly is, is Biden's support? It's a lot softer than people would assume it, was, it would be. So that's, that's really kind of a poll used well, not really trying to forecast things a year out by any stretch. Okay, now I want to share with you some specific ways that I think reporting on polls can go off the rails. Um, what you're seeing here is, um, this is real polling average data from the state of Florida in the 2020 cycle. And this chart from uh, a website, I think is, is makes several mistakes. Um, one, is uh, if you look on the left side, this chart is zoomed in to like a crazy amount. It only goes from 50 to 44. And what that zooming in so much does is it makes um, trivial small changes look important and significant when frankly they're not. And that just does a, a, a disservice to everybody. It presents decimal places, uh, which again um, is a disservice because frankly polls are not that precise. Polls are not going to get things right in the decimal place, not at all. Um, a third thing is sort of just missing context here, because I think a normal person, understandably, would look at this chart and, and come away with the impression of, gee, Biden's got pretty stable, significant lead here. He's clearly uh, got, a, got a stable lead over Trump. But uh, that's, that's really a, a, a naive read of, of these data, because the fact is, if you think about 2020, state polls in the 2020 cycle were off on average by five percentage points, okay? On average by five points. So if you see a race where it looks like a candidate is up by two, three, um, four points, that is within the margin that you should expect polls are probably gonna be off. And so um, that's definitely not a lead of, of any confidence or, or significance. I took those same data and presented it in, I think, a much more accurate, sort of honest way. And what you see here is that the polls are showing this race is tied, right? That's what the polls are accurately showing, that this is a competitive race. Frankly, either candidate could win. And in fact, you know, Biden didn't win Florida uh, in 2020, Trump did. Um, and so just, just keep these things in mind about the limits of polling data. All right, I'm going to share a, a few other specific things uh, to look out for. This was um, a poll released, uh, discussed about the, um, the South Carolina Senate race when you had Jamie Harrison going up against Lindsey Graham. And unfortunately, this reporter, don't do this. They took the bait. They, so there was um, the Democrats campaign pollster selectively released a poll that was favorable to their candidate. Um, and, and the reporter, unfortunately, just made a headline out of it. And, and again, that, that does a disservice because that really was not an accurate reflection. Lindsey Graham won that race comfortably. There's not a lot of other evidence suggesting that this was a particularly competitive race or that Harrison had a meaningful lead. Um, so beware of polls leaked to the media by campaigns. Uh, also beware of polls um, leaked that come from polling organizations that like appeared out of nowhere. So what I'm showing you here is, is a press release about or a write-up of a poll in a Michigan Senate race that claimed that Kid Rock was leading Debbie Stabenow. And the, the red flag here is that this quote unquote pollster set up their website like days before this poll came out. Um, it's not clear that this is even a real poll. Um, and so you wanna watch out for um, organizations or individuals that claim to have released a poll, but don't have any track record of being a credible pollster. 
Another uh, foundational thing to keep in mind is the margin of error and, and being sort of cognizant about the errors that, that polls have. I mean, I love polls. I, I um, devoted my career to polling, but, but they're imperfect, right? They're imprecise and we have to keep that in mind. And a, a key rule of thumb that people in the industry are aware of, but not enough people outside the industry are, is to really, you wanna mentally double the margin of error. So if you're looking at a poll and it says you got a margin of error of three percentage points, in your mind, you should probably think six or seven. Why is that? Um, the reason is that there are actually four broad types of errors in polling. And the margin of error only speaks to one of them. It only talks about the error from sampling. But there are three other error types. I don't have time to go in depth about this, but there are three other error types that exist in polling. And so my point is like, by definition, the margin of error is gonna be too low. It's gonna be a lower bound. And in reality, polls have more error than that margin would indicate. You wanna be particularly careful if you're reporting on subgroups, because again, by definition, those sample sizes are gonna be smaller. The, um, they're gonna be, the data is gonna be less precise, larger margins of error. Keep an eye on that. Uh, and, and then just to wrap up, we could probably talk for days about what's a, a marker of a good poll versus a bad poll. To be honest, it's not as clean and simple as it was like 20 years ago, but some high level things to, um, to look out for. To me, red flags, again, if a campaign poll, only because they're released selectively to the public and, and the media, um, how much a pollster talks about, is willing to disclose about their methodology is a big tell. Good pollsters stand by their methods and will, and will answer any detailed question you have about that. Sh shoddier pollsters um, will tell you that they're not able to talk about their methodology. Um, again, you wanna really look at, does the pollster have a credible track record of doing unbiased polling? You wanna look at the question wording. If the wording is politically biased, that's a, a big red flag. Now, what are the markers of a good poll? It's largely like the, you know, the flip of all those things. The last thing I would note though, is something that I really look for is, what was the source of the sample for the poll? Where did the pollster find the people to interview? And for truly good polls, the answer to that should be pretty simple and straightforward and make sense. It should be like, I used, you know, the sample from all the registered voters in the voter file, or, I sampled from all the addresses on the postal service file, or I sampled from all the landlines and cell phones uh, in the random digit file. And you see me repeating the word all, because that means like pollster using these sources, everyone had a chance of selection in the state or the nation, depending on the poll. Uh, uh, you know, a bad answer to that question is, oh, the poll was done online, or it was done online with the panel. And then you need to ask the follow-up question, well, how was that panel recruited? And, and you really wanna hear, again, one of these straightforward answers. Um, other polls are, are done with convenient sampling and, and those are more of a, a yellow or red flag depending on who you, you spot, speak with. Um, okay, I think those are the main points I wanted to, to cover. Happy to, to chat more later. And I'll turn it back over to um, Barth. Okay, great. Thank you, Courtney. Um, now that we have some definitions and some red flags, if any of you have any questions, go ahead and start putting them in the, into the chat um, and also share some of your poll resources. I know somebody just did that, so thank you for doing that. Uh, now we'll turn to Jane. Um, uh, go ahead and take it from here. Okay, hi, everybody. It's really great to be here. Thank you. And I, I did also just want to, um, I'm not sure if you're can you see the screen, the screen sharing? Okay. So um, I just want to thank you all. I'm not a journalist, never been one. Um, probably would not be a good one because as professor, we always say, oh, it's, it's complicated. And let me give you a hundred years worth of history to contextualize that. But I'm kind of going to do that in about the next five minutes. I have a few minutes um, just to provide some information for you. And I think Courtney, has given you so much great information about polling methods. I'd like to talk about something a little bit different. And I'd like to try to give you a highlight on some analytical tools. So you've got the polling methods. I'd like some analytical tools about two really important groups in the electorate today, and that is women and non-white voters. So 
I'm going to give you a little bit of data from the past uh, because the past is the best predictor of the future. Retrospection provides facts, gives you facts, is, uh, is the game of uh, the realm of uh, good journalism. But the future is prediction. So you do need to have a set of analytical tools. So I'm going to talk about, uh, I'll bring away four uh, actual things that I want to remind you of, but let's begin with a little bit of data. I just want to note that there's a lot of conventional wisdom. So I want to talk about women, women voters, minority voters, and then I'm going to say just a few things about the kinds of distinctions um, to make, as well as a little bit of advice on horse race polling again. So the conventional wisdom is that women support Democrats, right? So if you look at this first slide, it's basically, this is from the very big vote cast um, it's basically like what we used to do for exit polls and shows you that the same old gender gap is there, right? We've been seeing this gender gap really since the mid 1980s where 9% overall, there was a gender gap, more women than men supporting Biden. The same is true in all of these previous election years where you see women supporting uh, Obama in 08 and in 12. And in the case of 16, where the winner was the Republican, you see a gender gap for uh, still more women uh, supporting um, uh, Mrs. Clinton, uh, but the gender gap is negative for Trump. At the same time, the one of the first things I'm going to ask you to do and to think about is really to disaggregate your data. So this is from VoteCast. You can get this off of VoteCast. You can get it in many polls. Like, for example, in the Washington Post did polls in 2016, and I remember looking at it, and I looked at that cell for white women, and I thought, okay, it's over now. This is a November, it's actually an October poll. And that's when I thought it's not going to happen, right? It, it, I thought it might happen in the, um, not in the uh, popular vote, but in the electoral college vote. As you'll see in this, I've highlighted them just in blue and red. People of color voters, Black, Latinx, and other voters are heavily, heavily Democratic, right? And when you disaggregate by race as well as gender, what you see is that white women supported Trump in 2020. They also supported Trump. And by the way, this is just the Democrat and Republican margin. You can see it's pretty tight for white women, but it's really not at all tight for voters of color. Other data sources will show you the same thing. For example, academic data sources such as the University of California, Los Angeles does a very large poll and study. So for, I, I see there's a bunch of you guys from the LA Times. Um, there's plenty of um, scholars and, and institutes there such as the Ralph Bunch Institute for the study of African-Americans who will give you a good sense that there are large differences, right? Um, white women are the only group of voters here among female voters that support Republicans. And this is also true in the previous uh, three elections as well. White women have always been Republican. And in fact, in all of the elections since 1952, white women have supported Democrats only twice during that period. So you got to keep that in mind. There may be a gender gap, but even so, so white women are more Repub Democratic than white men, but they're still Republican supporters. This is also true for all other forms of, I see reporters writing a lot about this. Oh, what about the college graduates? What about the young people? What about, you know, as it turns out, every single one of these are um, uh, majority Republican, at least in 2016, the same is true in 2020. And the other thing I wanna just mention briefly is that women are the modal voter. Just look at the, the first column and the numbers highlighted in yellow. There's actually more women in the electorate than there are men right now. You know that, right? If you don't, well, now you do, right? The biggest slice of the pie are white women, 38% of the electorate. One of the questions I have is, why are they second in the table then? So somebody please update your tables at VoteCast. But the point is here that this is true really among all groups of voters. There are more Black women, women in the electorate than men, Black men, more Latinas uh, than there are Latino males in the electorate. So Keep in mind that the gender composition of the American electorate, this is not a new phenomenon. This has been the case since 1964. So women have always been the modal voter, at least in the modern period. Okay, so let's just, um, there's just a couple things that I'd like to emphasize in going. I see I'm at five minutes now, so I'll just move on. I think that it's really important to remember that women are the modal voter, but that they behave differently. They're not all Democratic, strong Democratic supporters. So for anybody who is uh, surprised about 2020 or 2016 and 
uh, the support of white female voters for Trump, you shouldn't be surprised because the data would have showed you to expect that. Um, at the same time, um, non-white voters are really important. Non-white voters today, as you could see from those data tables, make up 25% of the American electorate. That is the, num that is the people who voted, 25% of them, one in four is a non-white voter. And it varies a lot from state to state, um, but it also does matter even when there's a small number of voters from a given state. So Georgia, for example, is a big African-American population, but academic studies will demonstrate that the presence of Asian-American voters in particular in the Atlanta suburbs helped to propel two Democrats to win in those Georgia special election Senate races. So minority or voters, as you can see, are heavily democratic and race matters. It will matter in places like Arizona and Nevada and elsewhere. Last thing I just want to say, there were a couple last things, but last, uh, I'll just say one more thing. And I think it's something that you should be careful in making analytical distinctions about that polls, as Courtney mentioned, they're, the horse race polls are, are one thing, like who's going to win. But when you do a calculation, anybody who's going to call a race, <clears throat> when you do a calculation, <clears throat> enthusiasm, as Courtney mentioned in that New York Times poll, is an important one. But you always also need to consider the two main ingredients that go into predicting an outcome, and that is, you know, who are you going to convert and who are they supporting? But you also need a mobilization model, right? Because the enthusiasm goes directly to mobilization, conversion goes directly to um, who you're actually going to support. And it is important to consider all those different ways that polls can be informative. The last thing I'll just say is that you got to be thinking about state level stuff. And these three other people on this poll or on this uh on this uh, webinar are really the experts in where to go, right? Polit you know, Lou at PolitiFact, Aaron at the Cook Political Report and Courtney at Pew, which has a lot of great polls. My point is that you can look at this, these national polls, but please do remember that we have a thing called the Electoral College and that's why local races and state races really matter. Thanks for your time and I look forward to your questions. Great, thank you so much, Jane. Lou, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Sorry, I guess I'm unmuted. Uh, I'm gonna show you um, some stories that I've written, some some pretty recent uh, and some not, um, but they're all about polling and some of the pitfalls. Um, so hopefully you guys are seeing uh, my Nikki Haley article, which was from a couple days ago uh, in New Hampshire. Um, so this um, is an example of uh, a candidate um, cherry picking polls. Um, <clears throat> she's been citing for weeks now this one poll, which is a legitimate poll, is a Wall Street Journal poll that showed her 17 points ahead of Joe Biden. And she's been arguing, look, you know, Trump, Trump is like neck and neck against Biden. I can beat Biden by 17 points. So, uh, so when she said this at a town hall, uh, I decided to look into it. And um, there's a good database of uh, polls at 538.com, uh, looked into that and found that there are a total of nine polls since that one. That was early December, the 17.1. Um, in the subsequent nine polls, um, uh, none had anything close to 17 points. The, the biggest lead for her over Biden was eight points. Um, four of them sh did show her ahead by... Uh, in most cases by fairly narrow margins. Uh, this is ahead of Biden. Um, four showed Biden actually leading and one was tied. Um, now, when she said this, she she did specifically cite the Wall Street Journal poll, which she hadn't done in previous times. She made this talking point. Um, but the bottom line is that she's really cherry picky here to say there's a 17 point edge for her. Um, it is pretty misleading. Um, the other thing that's notable um, about the uh, um, about her statement here is that, um, uh, uh, sorry, she um, said that uh, uh, she she cited this without noting undecided voters. Um, and basically, uh, um, there were a large number of the undecided voters in this case, um, uh, which, um, uh, you know, makes sense. Trump is extremely well known. Biden's extremely well known. Nikki Haley is not. And so, you know, um, 
once those voters decide whether they like her or not and would vote for her, uh, that's going to change the dynamics of what the polls are. Um, another story I did in the past couple of weeks, um, Vivek Ramaswamy, who was running for president, uh, he was jumping on um, a Harris X poll that showed that uh, Gen Z voters uh, are divided 50-50 on whether they support Hamas or Israel. Um, this, uh, the, the like, poll is real and, and they were pretty transparent with, uh, with uh, uh, you know, when I asked them about how they did this uh, polling and so forth. Um, but there were a couple of things that, that were notable as I dug, dug further into the poll. Um, uh, they actually asked quite a lot of questions of, of these, um, uh, of, of the respondents. And um, certainly it's fair to say that, that the youngest voters were the most sympathetic to the Palestinians and least sympathetic to, to the Israelis in the conflict. Um, however, there were probably 10 or 12 different questions that sort of got at this in a different way. Um, you know, what their feelings were about the, um, uh, the, uh, war in Gaza. Um, and so for instance, um, let me find one. Uh, so the same people who were, uh, saying that they were, you know, equally simple or where, where a group about 50% said they were sympathetic to like Hamas and 50% said they were sympathetic to Israel. That same exact group of respondents said by two to one margins that the uh, that the actions of October 7th uh, were a terrorist attack, that the attacks were genocidal in nature, uh, that Israel has a responsibility to, re to retaliate against Hamas terrorists and that Hamas is a terror group that rules Gaza with force and fear and is not supported by them. So there were a bunch of answers that were really pretty contradictory. Um, which can be uh, possibly attributed to, to, to a couple of reasons. One is that, uh, you know, in this 18 to 24 age group, um, these are people who do not have a lot of experience with the long history of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So they haven't, um, you know, necessarily done a lot of thinking about it or le learning about it up until recently. Um, the other factor, and this is something Courtney alluded to, is that um, there were very few people in this um in this age group who were polled. So the total number of respondents in the poll of all ages was uh, 2,116. Um, uh, but in the 18 to 24 year uh, uh, group, um, it was about 199 people. Um, so whereas the sort of margin of error for the whole poll was in the three to 4% either direction range, it was um, I think seven, eight, nine percent So you gotta take it with a grain of salt. Um, another issue that has come up um, in my past reporting is poll wording. Um, so here's a poll um, that, that I wrote about in 2017. Um, uh, it got a lot of attention um, in conservative media outlets, including Infowars, Alex Jones's shock poll, 80% of Americans oppose sanctuary cities. Um, that was also based on a Harvard Harris poll. Um, but there are a couple um, significant issues that I noticed. So first of all, the poll doesn't use the term sanctuary city. And that's the term that a lot of uh, the sort of, you know, follow on reports uh, um, in the media fo focused on. But it never talked about that. It never used that term. Um, furthermore, the specific wording of the question was uh, notable. Um, so, uh, um, the key thing about sanctuary cities is that um, these are um, jurisdictions that do not report, uh, uh, you know, illegal um, immigrants to the federal government. Um, if they're uh, if they run into if there's like a contact with any police local police, if there's like a minor incident or if they're a witness, um, it's not a question of s simply letting murderers, rapists, and armed robbers go. Um, and the question, the way it was worded, um, didn't um, talk about this nuance. And so people um, who hear this question are thinking, uh, you know, that a sanctuary city is going to let a murderer go. Well, they're not. The, uh, you know, these are people who have broken taillights or, you know, who, who are, uh, you know, ha have a simple interaction as a witness with police. Um, and so, uh, 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 the point here is that it's always important to look at the question wording 
um, in the poll, which any good pollster worth their salt should be um, uh, uh, giving you the full wording, full full breakdowns of how people answered su uh, su subgroups and so forth. Um, I will uh, make maybe another point or two uh, if I have time and tell me if I don't. Um, let's see. Uh, um, just a couple other points uh, 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 to make. One is um, in looking at polls, uh, particularly it's like horse race polls, it's important to know uh, if the um, survey is made of registered voters or likely voters. Later in the election cycle, most uh, uh, pollsters will switch to a likely voter uh, uh, sort of model. And um, uh, it's important to know um, you know, how they're doing this. Um, is it based on, uh, you know, what, what are the factors that, that a given pollster um, uh, will use to determine what a likely voter is? They, they may not always tell you, but at the very least, it's important to know what, whether it's registered voters or likely voters. Um, waiting for education. Um, polls are weighted so that the uh, demographic uh, breakdown of all the respondents closely mirrors the population at large in terms of gender, in terms of race, uh, and so forth. Um, in starting in 2016, the two parties have become very bifurcated based on education. And a lot of the reasons the polls didn't really pick up on some of the dynamics in 2016 was they didn't wait for education. Um, I think that's better, and Courtney can speak probably more uh, to how widely the, the, the uh, 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 this is being done, um, but um, polls, generally speaking, that do wait for education, uh, you know, whether it's co college versus non non college populations, um, tend to be uh, more accurate. Um, and the final thing is, uh, uh, and Courtney did did uh, talk about this a little bit in that chart of how the polls are conducted. Cell phones um, uh, are huge now, um, obviously. Um, and so is the internet. Uh, um, polls that are done exclusively, if there are any, it doesn't look like there are too, too many left, based on landlines, are going to be hugely skewed. Uh, I think most responsible pollers have gone to a, a cell phone um, uh, sort of method, um, and uh, those those are, are the ones that you should really be, be, be uh, paying attention to. I think that's it. Great. Thank you, Lou. So questions matter. Uh, let's turn this over to what the questions that the pollsters are asking really matter. So let's turn this over to Aaron. Take this away talking about local polls. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Um, so I'm going to talk specifically about congressional polling, um, which if you're covering congressional races, you know these are pretty scarce. And so when you do get a poll, it it can be um, really easy to get excited about it and maybe run with the narrative when you're covering it. Um, I've certainly fallen for that temptation too. But there are um, a couple of tips that I have learned as I've been analyzing these polls over the years. <clears throat> and I just wanna walk through some red flags to look for and maybe some important questions to follow up when you do have campaigns or committees or PACs that are pitching you polls. Um, so like I said, very scarce um, and there are some nonpartisan pollsters like Sienna, Survey USA, sometimes Emerson that will pull congressional races. But a lot of times what you are seeing that is publicized are going to be partisan polls. And, you know, these can be useful, actually, because sometimes partisan pollsters can actually be better in some cases than the media pollster because they are getting paid to get this race right. Um, however, if they're choosing to publicize a poll and they're pitching it to you, they have an agenda. And so, um, you know, even if you, whether you choose not to cover it or not, you have to keep that in mind um, throughout your coverage, um, particularly in the headlines, which is where I think I see a lot of um, red flags show up in congressional polling specifically. Um, so as a lot of y'all probably know, campaigns can be really sneaky about the way they're pitching these polls sometimes. So maybe the press release for a poll that you're getting says, okay, candidate A leads candidate B by three points. And then you actually look at the polling memo and you see, oh wait, the margin of error was five points. So it's not actually accurate to write a headline that says that one candidate is leading the other candidate. Um, a more accurate headline might be, these two candidates are statistically tied. Um, but especially at this stage in the cycle, um, we're coming up a lot closer to these primaries, but it's still pretty early. And um, a lot of the horse race polling of congressional races um, 
I would take with a really large grain of salt at this point, and I would focus more on name ID of candidates um, and favorability and approval numbers of incumbents, because those are going to be probably better clues for looking at how vulnerable or how strong um, some of these members are in their races this year. Um, and then, like a lot of the other folks have said, there's some basic things to look out for when you're analyzing these polls. So the first major thing is just making sure that they have all the important information publicized with the polling memo that they're giving you. So that includes sample size, survey dates, margin of error, mode, um, who paid for the poll, which is not always mentioned in the polling memo. Um, it's not always clear if a campaign sponsored it or where it's coming from. And also, even if you're not publicizing the memo itself, it is really important to be able to read the memo as a reporter and see what the actual questions are and the order in which the questions are asked. Because um, that way you can spot leading questions um, or questions that are ordered in a way to make one candidate look better or another candidate look worse. And if a poll does use leading questions, um, so presenting positive or negative information about a candidate before asking a question about them, I would largely disregard those as well in your reporting of the poll. Um, these are kinds of questions are useful for the campaigns themselves because they're testing messages. But if you're trying to understand like the current state of the race um, and present that to your readers, I, I would largely ignore that or put it at the bottom of the story. And um, another thing, when you're reading a polling memo from a campaign, um, another question I like to ask myself is what are they not including? So sometimes campaigns will release one candidate's favorability numbers, but they won't release their opponent's favorability numbers. It doesn't mean that they didn't pull them. It just means that they maybe didn't choose to release them to you. Um, so that's something that I could follow up and ask about. Another thing, just as a general practice that I always ask about is if they pulled the presidential race in these congressional districts, because when you're covering um, presidential races, a lot of times the more accurate polling can be at the congressional level, um, which seems like it doesn't make sense because you're obviously dealing with um, a lot smaller sample sizes, but it is easier to pick up on trends um, that have not been picked up maybe in statewide polling at that point. So like, for example, in 2016, there were a lot of congressional polls that showed that Trump was actually doing quite well in some more white working class districts that was not being reflected yet in the statewide polls that these districts are in. Um, so sometimes just looking at the presidential numbers in these districts can also provide clues. And then I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. There is um, a recent poll um, that I wanted to show y'all one second. Um, and I think Pew might put it in the chat as well. And one second. All right, um, y'all should be able to see this now. So this is probably the most recent publicized congressional poll that I have seen this cycle. This came out a couple of days ago and it's a poll of one of the most competitive congressional races in the country right now, New Jersey's seventh district held by Republican Congressman Tom Kane. Um, he is one of the most vulnerable members in the country. We have this rated as a toss up. And so um, polling of this race is of a lot of interest to people, um, not just those in his district themselves. Um, and I think largely this is a pretty good write-up of this poll from the reporter. Um, and I'll point out, you know, um, the pollster, public policy polling is a reputable Democratic pollster. They pull a lot of campaigns. I would say their track record is pretty mixed, um, but this is the kind of pollster that has a reputation and you can like see how you've done, how they've done on previous polls. They're not just like a random pollster that popped out of nowhere. Um, and now I will say that um, when you're looking at the horse race polling at this stage, you'll see that Kane has a pretty decent lead over both Democrats that were polled here. Um, but again, at this stage in the race, this is before candidates have gone up on air with TV ads for the most part. So they're not well-defined, they're not well-known. Um, and it's really hard to judge what the actual um, horse race matchup might be like at this point. Um, but it is useful to look and see what candidates' name ID is like right now and what their favorability numbers are like. So I think probably the most interesting part of this poll, um, and I'll also note that this was publicized by one of the Democratic candidates. So obviously that needs to be at the top of the story. 
is um, the congressman's favorability rating and approval rating. So you'll see that Kane has a 26, 31% favorability rating, which I would say is um, for an incumbent congressman, especially one like Kane, who has a well-known last name in New Jersey, that is a pretty low rating and shows not only that his like favorability is pretty low, but also his name ID is quite low. Um, so this is something that um, I would focus on if I'm analyzing a poll at this stage in the race. When, it's, when it gets closer to the general election, it can be um, more useful to look at those horse race numbers. But at this stage, name ID favorability is really what you want to look out for. But um, I, I'll turn it back over to um, Bara. I don't want to take up too much more time. And um, if y'all have specific questions about any congressional race polling that you've been looking at, happy to take questions as well. Great. Thank you, Erin, for those great tips for reporters. Because we want this to be particip participatory, so please share your some of your favorite polling resources for those who are been tuning in, um, and also polls that you don't think are maybe might consider kind of garbage polls. And of course, let's start with um, some questions, putting those in the chat. I'm going to take my moderator's prerogative to start with one of a, a question. So wanted to know your thoughts about this, about um, whether polls affect uh, voters in terms of whether they decide to turn out at the polls, you know, how that affects kind of the civics of, of our elections. And I realize it depends upon, you know, the race and who the candidate is, but I'd be curious, Lou, Aaron, if you want to, or Aaron, if you want to start here, this question about how much polls affect voter turnout. That's a good question. I think it's really hard to um, judge that. It is obviously, um, this is a newer phenomenon. Um, you know, modern polling is a recent invention and um, the accessibility of it and the fact that people are able to follow it more closely and um, are learning about them is I think largely a product of the internet age. Um, but it's, I don't think that's something that, um, I've personally been able to look into, but um, it's definitely a question that I've like been asking myself more big picture. I would um, just say that, uh, um, uh, you know, voters often will uh, complain, oh, there's like too much horse race coverage in the media on politics. Uh, uh, you know, they, they should talk more about the issues, but then we write issue stories and no one reads them. Um, so voters are a little um, split in their brains on this question, I think. I'll just say from uh, the scholarly perspective, there are no significant studies that demonstrate um, paying attention to polls or not paying attention to polls has a systematic effect that's larger than any of the other ones that traditionally predict turnout. But this has actually been going on for a long time. So you remember the old Truman defeats Dewey, you know, like, it is, it is the case that people care, voters have always cared about like what everybody else is doing. Um, but I think the more important structural ones are like, you know, I think it's 1980 when Pacific uh, time zone states called the election before they were, or rather the, the elections were called before they were closed. Um, you know, what happens in Florida in 2000. The, I think the more significant concerns are the structural uh, reporting concerns than there are polls, but I don't know of any systematic and well-documented studies that demonstrate a specific result of people paying attention to polls and then um, that affecting their turnout. I think what's much more important is the role of misinformation. And even then we're, we have trouble identifying the exact role uh, on um, on turnout, I think the most significant thing is like when campaigns are negative, that's where a scholars have been able to define the most important effect. And to the extent that misinformation is negative, uh, that's probably where you're gonna find it. And to the extent that people use polls in order to support negative campaigning, that's probably where you'll find it. I uh, One thing I'd just add maybe is that um, in 2016, you saw um, voters um, much more supportive of third party candidates. They uh, took a larger share of the vote. In 2020, when the polls showed it was a very close race and the uh, two candidates, Biden and Trump, were more well defined, um, that third party vote went down. Usually in polls earlier in the campaign cycle, you'll see third party candidates getting, you know, maybe up to 10%, 12% of the vote. And they've 
and then on election day they get like two percent. So that's a long, long-standing pattern. It does suggest to me that maybe voters are uh, uh, sort of paying attention to the game dynamics of uh, you know what the polls are showing and how their vote could actually matter in the fall. Okay, thanks for that. So we'll start with a question from the audience. I hear so many interviewees, particularly college-educated Black men, say, I don't trust polls. I've never been polled, and I am and have been politically aware. Is there any way to improve polling accuracy for wider audiences? Anyone who wants to jump in here? I, I would say that the skepticism of polling is very widespread, as far as I can tell. It's not unique to any demographic group. Um, and uh, but it, it is a problem. I mean, and that is broadly why response rates part of one of the reasons response rates are as low as they are. We didn't really get into that today, but they're in any you know campaign poll you're going to cover. They're in the very low single digits, basically, and that's why there's a lot of skepticism about polling. Um, pollsters are, however, taking a lot of steps. Frankly, everything we could think of to combat this. Um, one one sort of um, step that I think is noteworthy in recent years is giving people multiple ways to respond rather than it's just a phone poll uh, where a lot of people frankly have you know incoming calls blocked or just an online poll and a lot of people aren't really keen on taking surveys online people um, I think the better uh, polls especially those by pollsters that have more resources to work with will give you the option, like you could respond by paper or phone or online. And there's some evidence that that can help um, with some of this, although it might not alleviate, you know, that sort of core skepticism that you're talking about. If I might add to that, I think that polling organizations need to take minority voters much more seriously. And if I were worrying about, if I were in the, in the Democratic Party, I would be worrying about that particular demographic, and I would be so, in particular, Black males who have shown over the last few elections to move away from the Democratic Party, introducing much more variance in the, that uh, predictive outcome. So part of the reason why pollsters don't really, as far as I know, I'm not a pollster most of the time, um, and it's because uh, pollsters sort of take for granted Black support for Democrats and Black turnout for Democrats, but I think that under circumstances where that could be changing, they need to do what we would just call an oversample, right? So like in a typical 1,000 person poll, which is typical, you know, you're going to get 250 non-white voters. And of those 250, you know, you have fewer and fewer degrees of freedom. So in other words, it's harder to get a result, like a difference between two candidates, that margin of error is going to be bigger because the sample is smaller, even if variance on the voting outcome is smaller. So what I would encourage people to ask your pollsters, um, why don't you ask about, you know, why don't you ask more uh, Black and Latino voters in particular? They're probably the ones who are going to be the most um, significant to in states like Florida, Latino voters in particular in states like Florida. So uh, what, what needs to happen is more attention needs to be paid in the data gathering and uh, stage of polling because there's only so much you can do if you only got you know of that 250 minority voters you have 100 black black voters it's very difficult to make predictions off of that Lou or Erin do you have any thoughts on this question I I mean I do think that um, I'll just add that I think media needs to do a better responsibility of explaining why we use certain pollsters and why we trust certain pollsters and how polling works within stories themselves. A lot of times, um, I think it, reporting takes for granted um, that the reader is gonna know as much about polling as the reporter. And that's usually not the case, obviously. Um, and so there is some role that um, we play as reporters with that as well. Right, yeah, transparency and how we're doing our reporting. I'm hearing that a lot as a way to build trust and. Um, uh, consumers who are reading our stories. Uh, another question um, related to just trustworthiness and polls, uh, Survey USA sometimes yield some odd results. What do the panelists think of this polling organization? Do you use them, Erin? Yeah, I, I think 
I would say that they're reputable. They're not the probably the most accurate media pollster out there um, when I'm thinking about congressional races. Um, but I think, yeah, you have to take it poll to poll. Um, there are, you know, sometimes when there is like a streak of bad polling from one pollster, um, it'll make me more likely to disregard future polls from them. But um, I don't know if it's a mixed record, I would just continue looking at the polls themselves and judging them individually. Um, so sorry, that's kind of a dodge of an answer. <laughs> um, I see uh, I, I see that a, a viewer has asked uh, a question about the pollster ratings of 538. I would just say that yesterday, 538 did their thoroughly revised pollster rate ratings. They got a couple hundred pollsters there, some some fairly active, some only one poll. Um, and uh, uh, I would definitely look 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 through that. I mean, uh, you know, I can't personally vouch for their methodology, but um, in general, uh, as I kind of skimmed through it yesterday, it seemed pretty good and seemed to align pretty well with my own um, sense. Uh, so so uh, so so I would take take a look at that. Question about the just back to the survey USA. What? Or in a poll, what goes wrong that they're that poll is not as accurate? Like, can you talk about that? Well, I, um, Sur Survey USA, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, they they like came came to prominence doing the sort of robocall polling. And are they exclusively Courtney? Do you know are they exclusively uh, still a robopoll? I believe they've changed, and I I don't okay. I have to get the latest. Yeah. yeah, I don't think that's still the case. Yeah. Well, one one factor that comes up, um, and I'd love to hear Courtney's take on this, um, uh, is the question of differential no, uh, partisan non non uh, response, which um, is the idea that if um, a a party or a candidate's um, supporters are kind of dejected, they they are less likely to pick up the phone uh, or go online or whatever for a poll, and those um, whose supporters are more um, aggressively, you know, happy about the way things are going with their candidate or their party are more likely to to uh, to to be a poll respondent, and this could really skew the ratings. People have been talking about how some of the uh, polling over the past six months, uh, where uh, Trump has been leading Biden, maybe sort of suggests that uh, uh, Trump ha has sort of receded from the public's mind in terms of his own critics but his supporters still like him and they're more likely to sort of answer polls. Um, I'd love to hear more from Courtney about that sort of phenomenon. Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of evidence that, um, that that's a problem in the field. It's, it's mostly a problem for pollsters that do what we call cross-sectional polls, which means I'm gonna interview a different thousand people every single time. Um, that's one type of poll. Other polls are done with, with panels where it's like you have, you know, like, 10 or 20,000 people who have agreed to take surveys multiple times, um, you know, over the course of, of some period. And in the panel, you have more information about who's in the survey, who declined to be surveyed. I think it's, you have more information to kind of combat that thing. Um, so it can make things a little bit easier. Uh, but I guess going back to the Barra's question, I, I, I wouldn't speak specifically to Survey USA, but Survey USA, in my mind, uh, is a type of a poll that a lot of their clients are local news media. Like they will do a poll for the Detroit, you know, news station or, or, or what have you. And I think the things in a lot of those polls, um, it's, it's nobody's fault, but they're done like on the cheap because those newsrooms, frankly, just don't have a lot of budget to do, um, you know, big, bold polls, right? That's just the reality. And the, the problem is, when you do sort of these local, very inexpensive polls, they can be, um, you know, robo polls or polls historically that were very heavy landline. And what happens is the sample you get with that type of methodology is gonna skew white, it's gonna skew old and probably Republican. And so you get these elections like 2016, those polls looked really accurate because like they got, not because they're like, a terrific poll, but by virtue of this sort of skew that they have built in, it actually captured the Trump phenomenon better than other polls. Um, and the interesting thing is online polls are kind of the opposite. If online polls tend to have a, a bias or a skew to their samples, it's gonna be like younger and progressive. 
And so if you're a really savvy reporter, you look at, is this mostly a phone poll? And to Lou's point, how much of this, if it's heavily sell, you're probably good. But if it's like robo polls, heavily landline, you really have to be worried about <laughs> skewing white, older Republican. And with online, you have to be worried about the poll skewing Democratic, frankly, because pollsters who do work online have to do a lot more statistical controlling to make sure that the poll is, is not skewing too Democratic, frankly. Yeah, thanks. And I think here's a question I think a lot of us um, sort of struggle with is as reporters, we try our best to be discerning in which polls we cover and how we write about them. However, some candidates or decision makers will use junk polls to make major decisions. Do you all have any advice on how to balance our coverage when we in the media try to be responsible, but our subjects have a different standard? I mean, th this is kind of the uh, dilemma that I face every day at PolitiFact, where we're fact-checking statements by politicians. And uh, we can do as thorough a job uh, looking into the data and and the, and the evidence um, and, uh, uh, you know, being as transparent as possible about all of our sourcing so that people can look into the original data that we looked at. Um, uh, and we can publish that. And it's up to people to read that. Um, and it's up to politicians to actually uh, change the things they say based on what is accurate. And we, we can't control that, unfortunately. Um, uh, so, you know, all we can do is provide the information for people who are curious and who, who have critical thinking. Uh, um, but we can't force people, uh, politicians or readers, to uh, sort of agree with us. Uh, all we can do is lay, you know, lay, it, lay, it, lay it out and... In the polling context, you know, I think um, uh, we should do as good a job as we can explaining how the poll was done, the methodology, sample sizes, margins of error, um, everything we we can know. And actually, one one uh, question I like to ask Courtney is, um, uh, how good is the sort of met methodology disclosure by pollsters? The uh, uh, to uh, you know, over the years, it's been sort of, you know, hit hit or miss. Is it getting better about what they're telling people? I th I think it's gotten better. There's a huge gap um, in general between sort of national pollsters and more state and local pollsters. State and local pollsters tend to disclose less. Um, they, they tend to do more of these sort of quick and dirty polls on, on smaller budgets. I would say in terms of the national polling space, the methodological disclosure is is very good almost across the board but it's it's quite different for the local ones um, you see the national pollsters really engage in sort of professional conferences and doing research and sharing research about what works well and what doesn't work well in polling and uh we'd, we'd love to get more engagement from um some of the state and local pollsters but but that um has, has not been as robust as would be ideal and we're Oh, I, I would just say that the the uh, the uh, 538 pollster uh, thing that came out yesterday, it's got a specific measurement that they list for every pollster about how transparent they are. So so that can be a good guide uh, for uh, in terms of trust uh, level, in terms of trust level. Okay. Yeah, the one, one I'm thing sorry, I'm sorry to Courtney to I just we have one more question here and we're going to we're going to have to wrap up. But there was a question about. Um, uh, is it ever safe or recommended to say candidate A's lead over candidate B is outside the margin of error or a statistical dead heat, given the statistical sampling margin of error applies to both candidates? Or should that boilerplate be avoided? Because um, that sort of refers to something earlier I think Jane was talking about. <clears throat> Lou, Aaron, what do you think? I mean, I um, I think that um, as uh, you know, as Aaron pointed out, um, really the uh, the like margin of error should be um, really framing your entire uh, portrayal of what that poll shows. If the um, if the margin of error um, is bigger than the uh, difference between the two candidates' um, scores in the poll, then it's not that somebody's ahead. It's that it's too close to call. It's a, like a dead heat or whatever. Um, so yeah, ter terminating that within the margin of error is fine. But basically, the the like key thing is not to say that like somebody's leading somebody if it's like a one point lead. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I, I go ahead. 
real quick, real quick, Aaron. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, and I would also add that I, if the lead is outside of the margin of error, you might as well just um, put the lead into the headline at that point, I think. Um, and maybe it's probably safer to um, even like use a shorthand like low single digits or high single digits. It's probably not going to be modestly low ahead. Yeah, like modestly. That. Yeah. In terms of like your the narrative when you're crafting like the narrative itself and the, and the headline, um, because I think. Yeah, we, the margin of error is oftentimes even bigger than what is actually disclosed in the poll. And so you want to be really careful, I think, when using that specific terminology in a headline. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. We're going to have to wrap up here. Thanks so much to our panel uh, for joining us today. You packed in so much information in this past hour. And thank you, participants, for joining us and for your questions and comments. I, I hope that uh, those of you who tuned in feel like you got a few tips for your reporting. And I'm sorry we weren't able to get all to all your questions, but please go ahead and send them to us and we can forward them on to the panelists. And um, we've got some good folks to reach out to now um, for more questions as well. We'll share a link to the video um, uh, and uh, some resources that were mentioned during this programming uh, in a follow-up email. And we just want to thank you again all for being here. This program is the first in a series of programs we plan to do this year to help you in your election reporting. So please check back in with us for future web webinars and events. Stay well, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.